So I am John Coates, the research director on the program at, uh, on the legal profession here at Harvard. I'm also a professor of law here. And on behalf of both the law school and the program, I got the distinct honor of welcoming back um, Senator Richard Blumenthal of Connecticut to campus today to talk about his proposed reforms to the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, a topic that the New York Times tells us could not be more timely. Um, we read almost daily startling new facts about foreign surveillance programs, which no doubt well intended, nevertheless, threaten long cherished rights of US citizens. Um, today's article alone makes this painfully clear, um, but it's just one of a series of articles that have focused attention on these courts for the first time since they were created 35 years ago. Senator Blumenthal's five terms as Attorney General of Connecticut, his experience as a US attorney, his military service, and his current service on the Judiciary Committee in the Senate, all of them combined to make him the ideal speaker for us today to talk and listen and think about the potential for the courts and the legal profession more generally to play um, an important role in protecting liberty uh, while doing so safely. Today's event is co-sponsored by so many different parts of Harvard institutions and centers that if I listed them all, um, we wouldn't have time for the remarks. So I'm just gonna mention a few, and forgive me if I leave somebody out um, that wishes to be identified, but in addition to the program, the Berkman Center um, for Studying Internet and Society, the Institute of Politics, the Human Rights Project, the Institute for Global Law and Policy, all have representatives here today and are delighted to participate in this event. And personally, Dean Minow and Professors Wilkins and Fallon asked me to pass along their greetings and regrets that they couldn't be here personally. Um, and finally, let me thank um, Sam Simon, who's a graduate um, of this school and now Judiciary Counsel for the Senator, and Derek Bryan and the rest of the PLP team for putting this together so efficiently. And I now give you Senator Richard Blumenthal. Thank you. Thank you, John, so much. I'm really honored and excited to be here. Uh, I had the great fortune of attending Harvard as an undergraduate, then attended that other place in New Haven uh, for law school. I'm told that the entire Yale Law School could fit in this building. I think there's a lot of wasted space in this building. Uh, but we need more space at the Yale Law School. And uh, I'm really uh, very, very grateful for this opportunity to be with you uh, today. And I'm going to speak as briefly as I can. Uh, and then I'm really looking forward to your comments and your questions, because what I have sought to do through some of the proposals that I've made is to begin to stimulate a debate about a process in a court that is largely secret. It's a black box. And the purpose of that debate really is to assure that we have both liberty and security. As John has very rightly said, that balance has to be struck. And it is a very timely topic, as he also mentioned, because of the revelation just this morning about some of the surveillance practices that are ongoing in our government that were unknown to most of us in the Congress, I would say, without exaggeration. And to me, even though I'm a member of the Armed Services Committee and I receive a lot of classified briefings about what goes on among our intelligence institutions and agencies, uh, Justice Louis Brandeis wrote that the Fourth Amendment, and I'm quoting, conferred as against the government the right to be left alone the most comprehensive of rights, and the right most valued by civilized men. The right to privacy today is intertwined with government surveillance that we see every day. In the war against terror, in the conflicts that we see abroad, in the threats to American citizens who are traveling and to our embassies. 
From the outset today, I want to make clear that I deeply respect and value the work of those intelligence agencies and institutions, all of the war fighters who are abroad protecting us, and the information that they need, which is of paramount importance to our nation. Uh, this activity needs and deserves the trust and credibility of the American people. And that's maybe the paramount reason why I've proposed some of these reforms, because trust and credibility depends on the appearance, appearance of fairness and accountability. And my fear is that some of those agencies and institutions are in peril of losing it. I have a number of proposals that are pretty straightforward and simple, but they are grounded in a long and complicated history, probably well known to many of you as uh, scholars of the right to privacy, which began right here at the Harvard Law School. In 1890, two of the law school's brightest Alumni, alumni Samuel Warren and Louis Brandeis partnered to write an article for the Harvard Law Review, and they called it the right to privacy, tracing the legal underpinnings of that right. And like all good lawyers, they grounded it in an analysis in precedent, claiming that the right they were expounding was, in quotes, as old as common law. But they also acknowledged that Part of the reason for their writing it was to prompt and propose something new. And they wrote that that right, while old, has, found, has been found necessary from time to time to define anew the exact nature and extent of such protection. They were particularly concerned about ri the rise of new technology and their vast potential to invade American privacy. They had in mind devices, and I'm quoting like instantaneous photograph, a device they feared would allow unscrupulous individuals to take, again I'm quoting, what is whispered in the closet and proclaim it from the housetops. The development of these technologies, they argued, required a fresh look at the protection secured by the right to privacy. Since 1890, the right to privacy has indeed evolved with the times. In 1965, the court, Supreme Court recognized that privacy entails the ability to make the most personal kinds of decisions, like the decision whether to bear children. In 1973, it held that these personal decisions include the decision to end an unwanted pregnancy. I was a law clerk to Justice Blackman the year after Roe v. Wade, and so I saw firsthand and heard firsthand the meaning that he felt and that the court felt the privacy rights entailed. The court has held that the government must have a warrant to use infrared technology to watch Americans walk around their homes or to use GPS technology to watch Americans drive around their towns and cities. Over the decades and the generations, the courts and culture of the United States have enshrined a right to privacy resilient enough to endure and last, even in the face of some of the greatest challenges, and we face those challenges today. By 1978, the government had access to technologies far more sophisticated than those instantaneous photographs. That was the year that the court passed the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, which was designed to impose rules and procedures on what before was viewed as a largely lawless intelligence apparatus. The Congress that passed FISA, the acronym is now probably as well known as the act, had seen what could happen when surveillance was not controlled by effective legal constraints. Those of you who uh, were around in 1975 remember the Church Committee, Senator Church held hearings and issued a report that revealed that for years the CIA was secretly opening and 
reading Americans' mail. Americans targeted for harassment experienced even worse violations and abuse. As part of that campaign, it gathered information on Martin Luther King. And you may recall the FBI planted microphones in his hotel rooms and sent the tapes to his wife in an effort to break up their marriage and threaten Dr. King. Individuals targeted for special surveillance included opponents of the Vietnam War, journalists, political opponents, congressional staffers, and even a United States congressman. The FISA statute, which was written in that year, 1978, took as a kind of legal blueprint or guidepost Title III. And for those of us and those of you who have been prosecutors, you know Title III is the statute that governs surveillance conducted in the course of a domestic criminal investigation, the garden variety criminal investigation that is done day in and day out by United States attorneys across the country. It allowed for surveillance when the government could show probable cause that an individual or an organization was, quote, a foreign power or, quote, an agent of a foreign power. With those terms defined to include individuals engaged in international terrorism. When the government felt it had probable cause, it asked the FISA court for an individual warrant authorizing surveillance, much as is done in our courts every day in those domestic investigations under Title III. And if the government wanted to expand its surveillance or look at a different target, it asked for a new warrant. The FISA statute differed from Title III in some very important ways. First of all, in the Title III context, the target of a government surveillance would generally eventually know about it, uh, if only because normally he would be notified. And he would therefore have a chance to challenge the surveillance. For example, if evidence was going to be admitted or if uh, the notification occurred, he could contest it in the course of a criminal proceeding in open court or even bring a civil action if there were an abuse of his rights. By contrast, the target of a FISA authorized surveillance probably never learned that he was targeted. And as a result, the case law governing Title III emerged through a very different process, an open, deliberative, litigation oriented process, an adversarial one, where Title III case law was shaped and is shaped by judicial decisions that result from that kind of litigated adversarial process. If a judge determines that a particular warrant was legal, he would do so only after hearing a lawyer argue that the warrant was legal or illegal. Those decisions and that determination would then be subject to appeal telling you stuff you already know, but it is distinctly different from the FISA process where there is no adversarial process. An ex parte hearing in which FISA warrants are issued is generally the last time any court will consider a warrant's validity. As a result, all of the decisions governing, governing the scope of what FISA allows emerge from a process in which the court hears only only the government's interpretation of the law and the Constitution. And while the Title III proceeding is almost always public, the FISA courts are generally not, in fact, never public, unless a case goes to the United States Supreme Court, which, in fact, has only happened uh, not from a FISA court, but from the Second Circuit Court of Appeals when a group sought standing to challenge the constitutionality of a law, Clapper versus Amnesty. Not only uh, can Americans not learn of a particular government surveillance request, but they can't learn of the legal standard that the courts use to determine. It's a secret law, secret court, secret law, secret process from beginning to end. And two of my colleagues, as you may know, Mark Udall and Rod Wyden, have introduced amendments, and I've supported them, 
to make the rulings, opinions, and orders of the FISA court public with redactions to assure that there would be no threat to national security. Unlike any other court in the country, the FISA courts uh, also are chosen by one person and only one person without any accountability. The Chief Justice of the United States chooses the members of the FISA court from among judges throughout the country without anyone reviewing those decisions. Today, uh, all of the FISA judges, all 11, have been appointed by John Roberts. 10 out of the 11 are Republican appointees to the bench. Half have backgrounds in executive branch activities, many of them prosecutors. In my view, uh, they fail to reflect the diversity in ideology and geography and background that our federal judges do across the country. And the issue is not only the reality of their views, the lack of diversity, it is the appearance as well. We know that process is important, that appearance of justice often shapes the reality and often is as important as the reality. Perception is vital to trust and credibility. I clerked for two Republican appointees to the bench, one a district court judge, the other United States Supreme Court judge. I can tell you they were as mindful and respectful and aggressive in protecting individual rights and liberties as any Democrat appointee. But perception is important. And the reality of what the court does, since it's completely unknown, we can't judge in terms of what the reality is. So uh, in this case, perception is especially important because the opinions are all secret. If the 20th century FISA statute, the 1978 one, created a risk that government surveillance would expand beyond appropriate boundaries, the 21st century amendments to the statute have dramatically increased that risk. In the wake of September 11, President George Bush authorized the NSA National Security Agency to conduct warrantless interception of phone and email communications when one party was outside the United States. So warrantless interceptions of messages when the person's outside the United States and believed to be an Al-Qaeda member. The FISA court subsequently narrowed the scope of permissible surveillance, but the legislative push to bolster our intelligence capabilities was on its way. The United States USA Patriot Act allowed the government to collect, quote, tangible things that are relevant to an authorized investigation. And then in the <clears throat> 2008 FISA Amendments Act, Congress asked the FISA courts, tasked the FISA courts with authorizing programmatic surveillance. So no longer would the government be limited to requesting individual warrants after showing probable cause to believe that an individual person or organization was the agent of a foreign power. Instead, the government could outline a broad surveillance program and receive court authorization, FISA court or authorization in secret with secret opinions after a non-adversarial process. Under the new regime, the FISA courts are asked to play the role of lawmaker. Now, we all know that every court makes law. And everybody in this room knows that it is, and I'm quoting the emphatically the province and duty of the judicial department to say what the law is. Anybody who has even a passing familiarity with statute knows that what the law is always involves an act of interpretation. And having been an attorney general, as well as now a member of a legislative body, I know that definitions are often vague and leave a lot of discretion to enforcement. 
So like it or not, the FISA courts decide in practice what the term relevant means when something is relevant to an investigation. They decide what minimization means. They decide what it is to look for information about the target. Those of you who read the story this morning in the Times know that this new disclosure involves interception of text-based communications like emails that are about a target, even if they don't involve the target himself. But the 21st century amendments to FISA make the FISA courts lawmakers in an even deeper and more profound sense, because under those amendments, the courts consider these extensive surveillance plans or programs, not just individual surveillance, not just inter interception of an individual communication, but a broader surveillance plan or program. And the size and focus of American surveillance state, therefore, are, to a large extent, in the hands of this secret court. Which brings us to today and a time when these revelations, new revelations about the size and scope of surveillance and intelligence gathering are surprising almost all Americans, including most members of Congress. And in fact, I hear from people across the state of Connecticut, uh, across the country, who email me and phone with a high degree of alarm and concern and fear about what is being done in their name and information being collected about them without their knowledge and what authority there is under any sections of either the Patriot Act or the FISA Act or the FISA amendments. And those questions are well-founded. As I see it, there are three reasons to be concerned, legal reasons. There are a lot of other reasons, but legal concerns that we can address through legal reforms. And those concerns are about the metadata collection that involves the scooping up or vacuuming up of the records of phone calls without content, but also the interception of text-based communication like email with content, and the interception then of phone calls through uh, various means after uh, those metadata are collected and they're queried or accessed. First, there is uh, the substantive concern, and uh, many of us share this concern about whether or not there is a constitutional justification for this kind of action. You know the case of Smith v. v Maryland, which involves the collection of the same kind of data, pen register data, by the government, which was found to be constitutional because there was no legitimate expectation of privacy. The standard, which is still good law, derived from Katz. And there's reason to question the wisdom and necessity of collecting this data, if not the legality of it under the Constitution. So there may well be a challenge to it. And the question is not only the legality, but also the policy. The Church Committee report that led to FISA provides example after example of the potential for abuse when government has access to large amounts of personal data. This substantive concern uh, has a substantive solution. Senator Patrick Leahy, who's chairman of the Judiciary Committee, I serve on the committee, has introduced legislation that would narrow the scope of the Patriot Act to limit the vast collection of metadata that we now know is occurring. I have co-sponsored this legislation, which I think is a sensible approach to a difficult issue. There's a second concern about the metadata program that relates to transparency. The Patriot Act authorizes the collection of records that are, quote, relevant to an authorized investigation, end quote. Most Americans would be surprised to learn that millions of, Amer or millions of records, in fact, 
the records of everybody in this room, everybody in Massachusetts, everybody in the United States fit that definition. Even Representative James Sensenbrenner, the House Republican who wrote the Patriot Act, said he didn't believe that the legislation authorizes data collection as broad as what has been revealed. And needless to say, if the very people who have written the legislation don't know what they're authorizing or don't believe they authorize what is actually being done, there is a problem of democratic accountability. The existence of secret law makes it less likely that the law on the books will reflect the will of the people. And that interpretation of the word relevant, whatever the opinion is, is still secret. The transparency concern comes with its own set of solutions. My colleague, Senator Jeff Merkley, has proposed revealing or disclosing, declassifying redacted versions of the FISA court's legal opinion. And another colleague, Senator Al Franken, has proposed allowing for the release of aggregate statistics on the extent of different forms of surveillance. I've supported and co-sponsored both of these measures, which would go a long way toward providing transparency, declassifying the opinions with redactions for security, so that the American people know what law governs their own actions, what the rules are. And finally, metadata collection, like other surveillance programs that have recently come to light, raise procedural concerns. Americans have, a, have strong and very disparate views on difficult questions of law or policy, but we feel, I think, almost all of us, that if the system is fair for adjudicating competing values, we're generally willing to accept the outcomes on legal and policy debates. Whatever our views on the extent of surveillance or even the degree of secrecy that surround surveillance programs, we'd be a lot more comfortable with the extensive surveillance program or any surveillance, if we could trust that there is a fair arbiter after a fair process. And we know as lawyers that process is important and changes in this process are vitally needed. Few Americans would say no surveillance should be conducted. And many Americans, I think, are concerned about the extent of surveillance that is ongoing right now. A good process provides a bulwark against abuse. One of the concerns that springs naturally from the realization that government has violated privacy, if that's occurred, is that it may misuse the data that it's collected. The Martin Luther King case is a perfect example. And having a better process also safeguards against those abuses. The process concerns are really what led to my proposals for reform of the FISA courts. And I have proposed two pieces of legislation that address directly not only the inadequacies, inadequacies and failings of the current process, but also would help to stop abuses. The first bill is called the FISA Court Reform Act. And this legislation would create a special advocate who would have the responsibility, in effect, to represent the Constitution. The Constitution would be her client. It would be her responsibility to represent and advocate the right of privacy, as well as other fundamental rights that could be endangered by surveillance. And we've learned, unfortunately, over the course of recent history, sadly and tragically, that the Constitution often needs a zealous advocate. I think that uh, the special advocate would, would play an important part also in addressing the transparency problem, because that advocate would participate in the FISA court and in the FISA 
court of review and could ask that opinions or rulings be made public with those redactions and could participate in that process as well. The transparency requirement, though, without an adversarial process, runs the risk of producing a catch-22. When the Attorney General claims that he's not obligated to release an opinion, nobody has the ability to object. The public responsibility of the special advocate would be to object and to appeal in the event that a FISA court made a decision contrary to constitutional principle. The appeal would be to the FISA Court of Review and then to the Supreme Court. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, my friends Mark Udall and Ron Wyden have been sounding an alarm about FISA surveillance for years, but until the disclosure by Edward Snowden, they couldn't even talk about what they knew from their experience and their knowledge as members of the Intelligence Committee. So having a special advocate is important to transparency as well as to due process. There would be no delay or in danger or jeopardy to security as a result of this special advocate. He or she could be cleared for security purposes and therefore could participate without any need for additional clearance, and the warrants by the FISA court could be issued without participation of the special advocate, much as they are now on an ex parte basis under Title III, but the special advocate would have access to all applications and could challenge them after the fact, almost immediately, and those warrants could be rescinded then if necessary. Now, uh, even with an adversarial process, and we know courts generally make better decisions when they hear two sides, both sides or other sides, the additional problem of the composition or makeup of the FISA court would remain. And that's why I have proposed a second measure, which is the FISA Judge Selection Reform Act. This legislation would, authorize the chief judge of every appellate circuit, the chief judge of all 13 circuit courts of appeals would be authorized to designate a judge to serve on the FISA court and uh, the chief justice then would appoint that individual. If for some reason the chief justice objected, the chief judge of the appellate circuit could propose someone else, but the likelihood is that designees of those chief judges of the appellate circuits would serve on the FISA court, increasing the diversity ideologically, geographically, and otherwise of the FISA court. I've focused on the procedural issues at stake. Procedure often determines substance. And I am mindful, as I said at the very start, of the need to strike a balance. The other revelations that we've seen over the last week have been involving threats to our security. These threats are credible and real. I don't think I need to go into any of the classified material that I've been provided to say to you that the interception of communication has led to information that I'm glad we had and may have actually deterred and protected Americans abroad against danger. These threats are real. There are people who mean to do us harm. They're not imagined. Uh, I've seen photographs and videos of their going about their daily lives, uh, engaging in activities that involve potential harm to not only our troops, but all of us and even our homeland. So we live in a dangerous world to 
use uh, perhaps an overused term, and we need to strike that balance in a way that preserves our security, but also recognizes that the brave Americans, and, and I have two sons in the military, so uh, I know what it is like to have loved ones in harm's way, deserve to fight for a country that respects and values the liberties that make our nation great. They're fighting for an America that respects civil rights and liberties and privacy. And so we need to make this nation worthy of the war fighters and the intelligence experts and operatives and all who put themselves in harm's way to protect our liberty, all who gather information so that we remain strong and free and in fact the greatest nation in the history of the world. I am pleased to be here and engage in this conversation with you so that we can make our contribution and I hope I can make a contribution toward assuring that the law is better made and better enforced and thank you for listening to me. Thank you very much. And welcome your questions. So we have time just for a few questions. If you could try to keep them uncharacteristically brief for a month of <laughs> Professor Freed. There's a microphone there. So <clears throat> Senator, like so many who engage in this debate, you talk about our privacy, our liberty, our rights, and how Americans. Uh, uh, are alarmed and fear. I must report, I am not alarmed. I don't fear anything. Now, abuse, yes. But what abuse do you have in mind? The, uh, uh, the Martin Luther King example, that is an abuse. And that can be dealt with as an abuse. But why should I be alarmed? Why should I fear the fact that somebody is collecting the addresses uh, of my emails? I don't care. Why, what is it that people are afraid of? That's what I never understand in this dis uh, discussion. Well, uh, you know, I'd welcome comments, obviously, from the audience, because I think uh, one of the distinctive characteristics of the American people is that they have a sense of privacy. It's one of the reasons that we rebelled. Uh, if you told uh, the founders that we would have a secret court making secret law, uh, issuing secret opinions, they would say, that sounds a lot like the Star Chamber. Sounds a lot like the courts that the king had that we didn't want in this country. So it is a process question, number one. Uh, number two, the reason why we want a process, a fair and challenging process, is to protect against those abuses. I'm assuming that we would agree, as lawyers, that there ought to be some standards. You might have no objection to the addresses on your envelopes being read or the email addresses being read, but I'm willing to bet there are some communications, maybe your financial or medical or familial information that you wouldn't want Richard Blumenthal as a member of the United States Senate pouring over uh, with unlimited amounts of access or some more faceless bureaucrat in the United States government, and then potentially uh, using it to make a case on what? You wouldn't necessarily know what violation of civil or criminal law might be uh, made. I think we can agree, though, as lawyers, regardless of whether you have a fear, that there ought to be standards that warrants 
And that process of authorizing surveillance should require meeting certain criteria, whether it's called reasonable, articulable suspicion or probable cause, uh, whether it is requiring some measure of evidence, some documentation, or simply the contention of a law enforcement expert, regardless of how it's shown that some standard ought to be met. And you may not fear the consequences of a standardless, in effect, arbitrary and capricious process because, frankly, you haven't seen it applied to you. Other Anyone questions? Else? Yes. If you could, if you could come to the mic, that'd be great. Or would you mind coming to the center, Harry or Henry? Um, anyone? The acoustics in our great space require this. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, Senator Ball and Harry Lewis, I'm an economic professor here, so I'm not a lawyer. Uh, so one of the uh, troubling uh, theses that seems to underlie the revelation, some of the programs that have been revealed recently, although I confess there have been so many, I confess there have been so many that uh, I may not have this right, is that the mere collection of data is not a search or a seizure, provided nobody peeks at it until they have the warrant in hand that enables them to do so. So it, am I correct that this seems to be one of the underlying theses in all this, which would suggest that you know we could all be tracked from birth Storage capacity is no, I mean, this didn't used to be a question because storage capacity would make that a silly thing, but it's no longer a silly uh, thing to imagine. And um, so that, that's my question. Is, 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 this, is this the sort of interpretation of the Fourth Amendment that is in some level underpinning uh, these vast data collection activities? Thank you. Well, the, the first point is that uh, as to the standards that are applied in obtaining a warrant, we don't know from the court itself because none of its opinions have been made public. I keep saying this, but I don't think I can say it enough because most people you know, operate intuitively because we've grown up in this country where courts issue opinions, courts are public. But the, the first answer to your question is, we don't know from the court. We do know from some of the government officials that this uh, metadata is essentially all obtained on the claim that it is relevant to an investigation. And again, what's relevant is a term that's been defined by the court apparently, but we don't know what it is. It can be accessed by the government in other words, they can go to the metadata if they can show a documented, reasonable, articulable suspicion. Now, the standards are different if they're looking at a foreign national as a non-United States person as opposed to an agent of a foreign power or a non-US person. These standards differ, but all of this Fourth Amendment jurisprudence has uh, really been uh, done in secrecy, if there is jurisprudence, if there is case law and, and precedent. So I think the simple answer to your question is that uh, we don't know. We've been told that there are standards by the Deputy Attorney General of the United States, James Cole, when he testified in the Judiciary Committee, or Robert Litt, who's counsel to the NSA, uh, in, at the same time, and uh, we know that uh, that probable cause has to be shown under some circumstances because that's what the statute says, but we don't know what that means in practice. Probable cause is not collected. Exactly. In other words, the, the data can be collected without probable cause, but it can be accessed only if certain standards are met. Hi, good afternoon, Senator. I'm Betty Hen. I'm a law student here from Boston. I just had a quick question about one of the 
proposals you suggested um, regarding the special advocate, um, the advocate, the individual that would advocate for the Constitution. Uh, my question or my concern is more just a need for clarification. I'm not sure of the type of role that we are foreseeing such an advocate to play. Um, and I, that just might be a misunderstanding on my part. I, the way I understood the Constitution to be is um, it is essentially an articulation of our rights, our principles, the principles that we apply to govern ourselves as a society. And it sounds like the proposal for a special advocate is essentially a proposal for somebody to give, to, to create an, a voice to the voice of the people. So if the Constitution is, in essence, the voice of the people, we're essentially seeking someone to give voice to that Constitution um, before the, the courts. It seems like, to me personally, I don't, I, I need clarification as to how we foresee such an individual, one individual to play, to take on that tremendous responsibility. Um, if we've drafted a Constitution for that specific purpose, why are we now looking to appoint an individual to do the job that the Constitution essentially should be doing? Uh, another good question. As you know, uh, the Constitution, like any law, is meaningless unless it's enforced. And sometimes it can't be for enforced under particular circumstances in a case unless someone is advocating how it should be enforced. So the special advocate, in a sense, would be testing, challenging, questioning, the government's point of view. What is the meaning of relevant? Is this collection of metadata relevant to an investigation? What does that mean, relevant? Well, the government says one thing, but the advocate for the Constitution, whether it's Fourth Amendment or due process, might have a different view. Has there been minimization? That's something else that has to be done. In other words, even if the government looks at that content, the contents of that metadata, it has to minimize its review of parties unconnected. It can't just rummage through content that's about a target of an investigation. And what does that mean, minimization? What do these standards mean like articulable, reasonable suspicion? And the, ad, the special advocate would set forth uh, a view, different presumably from the government's, where he or she thought that the government was overreaching or overstepping or doing something inconsistent with those constitutional principles. So you're right that the Constitution should be our voice. It should protect our liberties and our rights. But someone has to be the voice for the Constitution and thereby protect it. Um, I'm sorry, can I just sure. ask one more question? I'm sorry, I didn't want to put it. Um, I guess what I was most particularly concerned with is the fact that one person will be entrusted with that heavy responsibility of advocating for the Constitution as an articulation of all our rights. My concern is who will appoint this special advocate? Who, whose opinions, whose perspectives will be embedded in the special advocate's own arguments and the, the special advocate's own defense of our Constitution? It seems that the, the problems we're facing now with our Congress, um, not always representing the will of the people, will similarly be raised with the situation with the special advocate. So it'll be very difficult for a special advocate to represent the beliefs and ideals of all the people. Well, I think that's uh, a good question. And by the way, the, the question of um, appointment is one that runs through all of these reforms. For example, you know, some of the proposals for the FISA court appointees are that you know, they should be appointed by the president with the advice and consent of the Senate. People object to that process because they're afraid it would politicize the court and that the court would then reflect too much the executive branch's point of view. We've seen enough about the appointment and the filibuster process as applied to judges to know that it often does become politicized. And likewise, with the special advocate, what I proposed is that there should be a nomination 
by a board that's uh, uh, an independent, impartial board. It's called the Privacy and Civil Liberties Board. Uh, Privacy and Civil Liberties Board is composed of people outside the government who uh, would designate someone whom then would be appointed by the presiding judge of the FISA court, similar to what happens now with the public defender. Think of it as the public defender model. He's appointed by the judiciary. He's a, uh, an employee of the judiciary, but anybody who knows anything about public defenders, and I've been a prosecutor, a U.S. attorney, federal public defenders are nothing if not zealous in defending their clients. I think the culture and ethic of the advocacy process generates the kind of zeal that we want on behalf of the mm -hmm. Constitution. And again, the important point is that courts do better when they hear two sides of the issue. In fact, the ethic, the whole core theory of our judicial system is we ought to have litigation. We ought to have two sides represented in court. And this piggybacks on his question. I understand that the uh, special uh, defender would have would be some safeguards and so forth. But if it's all in private and no one gets to hear what the special defender is saying, how do you know if he's doing his job? How does anyone get to judge? Are we uh, dependent on who appoints the special defender to be, have a good process where they appoint someone who's going to do take this job seriously? Uh, another great question, uh, and again, you know, trying to strike a balance between the needs for security and the goal of having some kind of adversarial system. I think the answer to your question is several fold. First of all, assuming there were greater transparency in the review or appellate process, I think ineffective counsel, the analogy to the criminal court process would be disclosed at some point. If a, an advocate fails to make an argument in the equivalent of the trial court, that would become apparent on review at some point. Second, the FISA court would presumably have a stake in an effective special advocate. Most judges are pretty discerning and demanding when it comes to arguments made to them, litigation before them. And I think that the FISA court itself would be a point of quality control. And uh, I'm very hopeful that the choice of a special advocate would be someone of distinction and very high standing in the legal community whose record before that appointment would indicate a very high level of competence. Great, I think that's all we have time for. So let's thank the Senator one more time. Thank you. Um, let me, let me uh, thank you again. And to sort of complete an answer to Professor Freed's question uh, about possibly the lack of fear, I think a lot of Americans share that point of view. Uh, the polls show, by the way, uh, that Americans fear threats to security more than they fear the threat of surveillance abuse. But the reason I'm here at the Harvard Law School is that you have a tradition, not just the Harvard Law School, obviously, but the tradition of, the, uh, of academia, of uh, lawyers of your caliber is to look ahead, look around the corners, see the potential for abuse, and try to do something about it. So thank you very much. Thank you very much.